Welcome to the 278th meeting of the New York Comics and Picture Story Symposium. Ooh. I'm uh, Ben Catcher, I'm a cartoonist. And uh, this um, Comics and Picture Story Symposium started back in 2012 uh, as part of something called Occupy University. That was a, an attempt to start a free university um, connected to the activity around Occupy Wall Street in New York. And uh, it was meant to be an ongoing lecture series on text and image work, comics, illustration, animation, that would be free and open to the public. And uh, in the absence of state funding, starting a free university meant that it was subsidized by the faculty and the students. And uh, the Occupy University still has events on May Day every year, but I, I believe that this, the comic symposium is the only a course that still happens on a weekly basis. And uh, thanks to the pandemic, uh, the symposium is now online this fall, and that opens up the possibility of having speakers and participants from all over the world. Uh, and our guest tonight, who may have not been able to make it to New York, is Simon Hanselman. He was, can applaud, he was born in Tasmania, which is an island state of Australia that's located 150 miles to the south of the Australian mainland. And he currently lives in Seattle, Washington. That's where he's broadcasting from tonight. Uh, his New York Times best-selling uh, Meeg, Mog, and Owl series has been translated into 13 languages. It was nominated for multiple Ignatz and Eisner Awards and won the Best Series Award at the Angoulême International Comics Festival in 2018. This series includes the just-released Seeds and Stems, uh, Bad Gateway from 2019, One More Year from 2017, uh, Meg and Mog in Amsterdam from 2016, uh, MAGA Hex uh, from 2014, Life Zone from 2013. And I think that's I think that's it. Um, Simon spoke in person at the Comic Symposium back in 2014. He was on a panel with uh, Michael DeForge and Patrick Kyle, and at that time he discussed the Australian comic scene the virtues of Tumblr as a distribution platform, That's outdated. Uh, schemes for making money, the future, and his general comics making process. He's back tonight to discuss self-publishing zines, collecting comics for the mass market, and his new book, Seeds and Stems. So please welcome Simon Hanselman. Hello. Thank you for the introduction, Ben. That was a, a crack introduction. Thank you. I should point out I do have a sponsor for, for tonight's talk. I've been sponsored by Patty O'Reilly's Dry Night Sanitary Pads. That's an Irish yeah. brand of sanitary pads. Yeah, Patty O'Reilly's Dry Night Sanitary Pads. So check them out online if you're in the market for any of those. So yeah, my God, uh, the world's descending into chaos. Uh, I'm sure everyone's maybe as anxious as I am. Um, my God, let's attempt to talk about funny books, uh, the, the comics, the zines. Um, so yeah, I mean, Ben kind of summed up the introduction. I'm from Tasmania, um, 1981. Uh, you know, I'm almost 39. Um, I've been self-publishing comics since 88, when I was like seven years old. I started very young, like an odd Peter Pan. Um, yeah, I don't know where it came from. I don't know where I got the idea. I just was drawing comics and somehow decided that I would self-publish them and sell them at the schoolyard. Um, 
and yeah, never stopped. And I've had you know, quite the exciting, raucous journey throughout my life, uh, sitting in a small room under a lamp, staring at a piece of paper. It's been crazy, just nonstop hilarity and excitement. So yeah, I think when I started self-publishing in Tasmania in 88, as a seven-year-old, I would go to the corner news agent who had a Xerox machine and I'd just Xerox from the originals, uh, like, you know, stra you know, get the originals, strap them up, like tape them, just like make a mock-up of the book and then like have to flip it on the copy machine and keep an eye on the drawer and through trial and error, just, uh, you know, figured out how to do it. I think originally they were probably like flat stacks, just you stack the paper and three staples, but then you figure out how to fold stuff and divisible of four. And, you know, you figure out how to put a book together and how to count pages, uh, trial and error. So, yeah, uh, you know, I was doing that, selling my, my schoolyard comics. I think my first comic was just a straight rip off of uh, Spy vs. Spy from Mad Magazine. I think I think I may have actually just ripped pages out of Mad magazines and printed those along with my versions, which uh, you know are seven. So you know you know don't come at me, um, you know don't try and sue me. I was a child. I think the first issue of the first zine I ever put out had a free Garfield Band Aid on the front cover because I, I knew that you had to entice readers. You had to try and draw them in and like you know what am I getting here? And it's like well you're getting this rip off Mad magazine thing, but you're also getting a, a, a little plaster with Garfield on it. So that was very attractive to our children in a schoolyard. So, you know, I, I'd shift a few of those. I, I grew up quite poor. Um, my mother was a heroin addict, uh, you know, good shoplifter, which was great, but a heroin addict nonetheless. So we were often strapped for cash. So it was nice to make a bit of scratch on the schoolyard selling my Band-Aids and uh, flat stack zines. And then I progressed uh, in high school to working with uh, some friends uh, a guy called Doug who just disappeared. He's probably lying dead somewhere now in a ditch. I'm not sure, but uh, we did something called Comic Book. Great name for a comic book. I think that was before John Kay did it as well. Um, I think we came up with that generic uh, title before him. We were really pioneers of our time in Tasmania in the 80s. Uh, then I went on to something called Comics Rodeo, which also predated uh, Paper Rodeo. Um, so uh, that was the paper rad thing, uh, paper rodeo. I was accused of being a ripoff of paper rad later in my career. We'll get to that later, but we did come up with the name Comics Rodeo before them. So, you know, we were all obsessed with cowboy stuff back then. You know, it was the eighties. Everyone was experimenting with being a cowboy. Uh, so yeah, I did uh, Comics Rodeo with my friend, Luke Randall, who also escaped Tasmania. Um, it's hard to get out of Tasmania. It's a tiny island, a lot of people, a lot of my friends are in prison for manslaughter and like break and enters and, but Luke and I really wanted to be artists and make something of ourselves. And he ended up in LA working at DreamWorks. He used to animate Shrek's ears. Like whenever you watch Shrek and you see his ears twitching, that was my friend Luke of the famous uh, comics rodeo high school zine. Um, he, he was great talent, but he moved away from comics. Yeah, we did Comics Rodeo for a while. We started publishing that at his father's uh, like wood burning fire, kind of like a shop that sold you know, wood burning stoves, wood burning fires. So we'd use the office, uh, tiny Xerox machine, like just a little single sheet, little piece of crap, uh, always running out of toner. Yeah, we'd publish them there, um, sell them again on the playground. Most of my work at that time was inspired by sort of like Pete Bag and stuff. When I was 13, I started reading, you know, you know, I went from funny animal comics, Asterix, Tintin, to superheroes. And then when I was about 13 to like Daniel Klaus, Julie Desay, stuff like that. So my comics in high school were full of sex and violence. And uh, the principal did not take kindly to this, Mr. Fagan. Um, I actually dropped out of high school or year, uh, year 10 dropped out said, fuck it, I just want to make comics. I know what I want to do. Everyone can just fuck off. And I took the gamble. I took the plunge. Uh, a fool's errand, perhaps. Uh, you know, skip to the end. It, it, it did work out rather well. But, uh, you know, fraught with peril. Uh, my mother didn't care. Um, she was a bit high at the time. And she's like, oh, whatever you want to do. Like, ah, ah, ah. And just sort of let me go off and, uh, and draw comics. And you know, I was on government benefits and worked at McDonald's and all sorts of shitty jobs. Um, yeah, and just kept making comics in my, in my bedroom in Tasmania uh, with 
a lot of my friends had moved to the mainland, uh, had moved away to Melbourne a- across the ocean. You know, ben was talking about the ocean stretch earlier. Um, but yeah, it's hard to escape, hard to get out of there. But yeah, no shit, we did Comics Rodeo. I think we did like four issues, dropped out of high school. Um, went back for year 11, I think. I think I actually, they somehow let me back in and I completed year 11, I did graphic design. My teacher hated me, I hated him. He was a fingerless Christian who painted large scale paintings of simple daisy patterns. Uh, so I really didn't trust his opinion. Um, he was actually an awful teacher, uh, very unsupportive. Um, I, think, I think I was the school magazine cartoonist for a time. Uh, Luke, my DreamWorks friend and I, we uh, had very little success, did comics for the school paper. And then, yeah, he dropped out of year 12 and I was left with all the jocks and the hunks and, uh, and I dropped out again. I was like, you know, fuck this. Um, we didn't like going to school much. I think once we actually called in a bomb threat so we could just go to the park and get stoned and then go home and draw comics. Um, yeah, so I mean, then it just all, it just all blurs into one amorphous blob after school. I've just literally been sitting in a room drawing comics in different cities around the world. Um, shit. I think it was 21 when I, when I moved out of, uh, out of home, away from my mother and moved not to the mainland Australia, but further south, deeper into the wilds of Tasmania. So I traveled down there and found some zines in a, in a vegan cafe. And these zines really impressed me. Uh, the people I'm still friends with to this day, it was, it was a great zine, and really weird, Al Columbia kind of inspired stuff. And I was like, who, who the fuck is this? And you know, we started talking to each other, not on the internet, I think, maybe I phoned them or something, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, started going down to Hobart, hanging out with these people. A lot of them were in bands. So yeah, I moved there when I was 21, started being in bands, started making comics, doing art shows. I think we did like eight issues of this anthology. I was doing a lot of solo zines and just cranking stuff out, uh, doing work for the doll. It was like, the, you know, I was on a benefit. It's a very poor employment mania since the seventies, a lot of unemployment. So, you know, there weren't many jobs to be had really, which I think was fantastic because you could get on the government benefits. And then we just made art like all day and, it was a really great time, you know, to be in a poor economic situation, but have free time and just work on stuff, experiment, further your skills. Like if it was now and I was putting stuff online, then all this embarrassing raw early work would all be there, but none of it exists anymore. Like I don't have any of it. I don't know anyone who has any of these old zines. They're all just dead and buried and that, that suits me fine. Um, I would hate to have people see that early work. You know, not, not least for the fact that there's probably like some horrible small town racism in there from like someone who was surrounded by horrible sort of, you know, yeah, yeah. Tasmania is a pretty rough and ready sports driven place. So, uh, you know, once I got out into the world and broadened my horizons a bit, I think that was a really good thing just to see more art and meet more people and, you know, inject more influences into my work. Uh, so yeah, kept on doing that, uh, just whittling away the days, uh, making weird puppet shows and comics in Tasmania. I think I finally moved to uh, Melbourne, the the mainland, you know, in 2008. Uh, I'd met a touring musician um, and we just kind of fell in love, just arts wise. And he started to get into comics and I was doing more music and it just all blurred and we lived together. I'd, lived in his mother's garden shed in Melbourne. Free rent, that, that's what enabled me to move to the mainland. Free rent, lived in an unlockable cockroach filled garden shed. And uh, yeah, was working on my, at the time, magnum opus, uh, Girl Mountain, which was a Twin Peaksian kind of yeah, small town drama with some sci-fi elements that I'd you know, written when I was 21 and thought, you know, I'm ready. I've been self-publishing since I was like, you know, seven, like, oh, I'm ready. I'm going to tackle the big thousand page graphic novel, you know, big fucking mistake, young, dumb, not ready, spent seven years on it with fluctuating styles. And it was just a massive mess, but an incredible learning experience to 
I'm very privileged, I suppose, to be able to have thrown away 260 pages of, of work and, you know, and just call it a learning experience. I, I don't know really these days if you can be afforded that kind of luxury, but uh, that was good. And then, uh, I, I, fuck, I think six months after I was in Melbourne, I ended up in London. I, I met someone and, you know, moved to London. They were going to go study there. So I moved over there with her and worked a lot of, again, shitty jobs. Uh, bird shit scraping out of aircraft hangars, uh, breaking down old art galleries, you know, got poisoned by some asbestos or something doing that. Uh, that was interesting. Had some, some strange visions. Worked in bookstores a lot. I was a bookseller. Um, you know, the, the bitter bookseller, like, you know, arranging the graphic novel section of the bookstore. Like, oh, I wish my books could be here. Oh, look at all these pricks. Oh, I'm better than these bastards. That kind of arrogance. And the bookstore was exclusively filled with failed musicians, writers, artists, uh, you know, that's who it attracts. Uh, yeah, great people, uh, you know, a good time, a grueling, a grueling job, but, uh, but rewarding in the end. And it was nice to learn about the book system and stuff. Oh, what's an ISBN? And, you know, how to order books and just the market, I guess. I am obsessed with marketing and uh, stuff like that. End of the aisle displays. Mm. So yeah, uh, that's where I started Megan Mogg in, uh, in London, 2009. I was dead tired of my teen drama, Girl Mountain thing. I it was a failure. I think at the time, I actually didn't think it was a failure, but I wanted to do something different. So I thought I'm going to do a fun episodic sitcom type thing. I'd been drawing a lot of witches and cats. So I thought I'll, I'll name them Megan Mogg after these children's books I grew up with not knowing that in the future it would become a popular series and I would be dogged forever by the comparison to these children's books and people calling it a, you know, like an adult pastiche or, a, you know, a version of it. It's not, it's, it's no, it was never intended to be like a rough adult version of these uh, children's books. They are wonderful children's books. Uh, Helen Nickel, Jan Piankowski, uh, they're, they're lovely books. But yeah, started doing the Meg and the Mog. Um, started printing up uh, zines again. I think I read uh, Body World by Dash Shaw online. I'd always despised web comics and the idea of giving away content for free on this newfangled computer system. I wanted to make books, I wanted to make zines, I wanted to have an exchange of paper money for a paper product. So yeah, I saw Body World and it it made me think like maybe it's viable. Maybe I can put stuff online. I, I couldn't afford to print my work in color. I couldn't do the color zines, but I thought I'll just do the work in color anyway and print it in black and white. Maybe in the future I can put it online. Maybe someone will publish it in the future has money and can afford color Xerox. So yeah, I was going down to Ryman's upon Thames, a little stationery store using their photocopy machine. I think, uh, like a zine like this, like a sort of somewhat color, kind of, you know, there's a bit of color in here. You know, it's like 30 pages. I think that was costing me nine pounds a unit to print, uh, which is utterly outrageous. So I, I'd looked for a local printer, a little print shop, family run print shop could do it for me, but I, I couldn't find any. It was, well, actually that harkens back to Tasmania. Uh, we had free photocopying there. All of the local sort of uh, liberal, politicians would offer the public free photocopies and Xerox, free water, free phone calls, faxes. So me and my friends would literally spend like six hours in their office in the back room, printing up big fat zines and just going crazy with all the paper stocks and experimenting. And yeah, it was a rude shock to move to Melbourne and then London and not have that outlet to, you know, I talked to artist friends in Melbourne, like, is there somewhere we can get cheap printing? Like, well, if you're a university student, you can sneak in and do this. And, you know, I had a friend at a Xerox shop who'd let me in on the weekend and I could scam free photocopies through him. But yeah, in, in London, I was just printing these disgustingly overpriced to produce zines and then trying to sell them at uh, noise shows. I, I was doing noise music stuff. Like, you know, I'd take my shirt off and like shout into a contact mic and, you know, bang on a drum and like, you know, whatever. And, and then afterwards, like, oh, would you like to buy a Megan Mog zine? It's, you know, it's it's 10 pounds so I can make like, you know, a, a very, very small profit and just try and get the work out there. But uh, nobody was biting. Um, I think MySpace had just become a thing like Facebook and MySpace were just starting to be, you know, 
bleed into the public conscious, social media, the very early days of uh, social media, the, the quaint days of social media, where it's a bit more nice. So yeah, I put some stuff on MySpace, which was predominantly for music. Um, yeah, I was putting my comics on there. And I think a few people saw it, like uh, tiny mixtapes, like a semi-popular American sort of pitchfork ripoff music website. Um, they asked me to put some comics on their website. I think once I walked into a, a bookstore and was looking through an art magazine that I really liked. And um, there was a review of one of my zines in there, um, which like floored me, I, like wet myself in the, in the news agent. Um, that, that was crazy. I think at that point I was like, oh, I've made it. Like, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm totally gonna make it, that's it. Um, but then I think I moved a house five times in, in a year and everything fell apart and I lost a bunch of things and nothing happened. It took another 10 years. Um, so yeah, came back from London to, to Melbourne, still doing Megan Mogg. Uh, started doing all the zine fairs in Melbourne. I mean, throughout all this rambling, Zine fairs, always. In Tasmania, they're often free, free to table, you know, or a small fee. So any zine fair or any sort of paper product, uh, jamboree or flea market that I could go to, I would go to and attempt to shift my wares. And slowly it started to build up, you know, slowly you, you, you meet people, like-minded kindred spirits, who, people start to know you. I think there was always consistency with my work. It was always... I always push myself, I don't know why, but it's just been this burning passion and self-flagellation to just continuously be putting work out. So I think that consistency really helped and people started, you know, you, you, it's like anything, you have to, you know, roll a snowball up until it gets bigger. So yeah, eventually people started like, oh, it's the Megan Mog guy, it's the witch and cat guy. And yeah, it, uh, you know, started to take off a little bit locally. And then my friend who I, whose garden shed I lived in, um, Grant, is still my best friend uh, and, a, and a fantastic cartoonist and musician in his own right. Um, yeah, he, he told me to put stuff on Tumblr. As Ben said earlier, I was talking in 2014 about Tumblr, which is utterly dead now. Uh, the final nail in the coffin for Tumblr was them getting rid of pornography because then all sex moved away. That was bad luck. They bought in a lot of censorship and yeah, it just died. I mean, Tumblr was great. It was booming back then. Your, your, your Michael the Forges and your, your Leslie Steins or whatever, your, you know, all your, all your cartoonists from back in the, you know, back in the seven years ago days, all those old days, everyone was on Tumblr and it was, it was booming. And, you know, previous to just, you know, previous to putting stuff on Tumblr, I was working in a bookstore, like a medical bookstore. I was selling stethoscopes. I was doing mail order. It was, you know, I had no business selling oncology texts. I didn't know about it. Like, why was I there? But yeah, I was desperate. I was nearly 30. I'd always wanted to be published by the time I was 30. That was my goal. Like, I want to be published by Fantagraphics by the time I'm 30. And, uh, yeah, Grant told me to put stuff on Tumblr. And I did. And I think it was about like a month or two later, I had like Dan the Dell from Picture Box, Annie Koyama from Koyama Press, I had uh, Misma, a great French publisher, I had Fulgencio Pimentel in Spain, I had all these publishers trying to get me. And then Fanographics, then an actual fucking email from Fanographics. I, I was too scared to send them any, you know, submissions. I you know, have very low self-esteem about my work and, you know, detest my work. I try my best. Uh, you know, I, I think it's healthy to sort of really deeply criticize your work and interrogate what's wrong and right about it. And, you know, you don't want to be arrogant about it. That's, that's death. Um, so yeah, it just Tumblr <sighs> broke everything for me. My, my hatred of web comics and putting work on the web for years was stupidity. Um, or just, I don't know. I, I wanted to wait and see what was going to happen with the internet. You know, what, what's this newfangled internet thing? What's, what's going on here? Like, let's just, let's just wait. Let's just, you know, see what happens. And it started to look like a viable distribution method to me probably 10 years after everybody else figured that out. Um, yeah. So yeah, it all kind of blew up after Tumblr uh, really quick. I mean, that was like 2013. And then I think like a year later, I was at the fucking comic symposium and stuff like, you know, hanging out with like famous people and stuff and, you know, going to like Dan Clouse's studio or something, Alvin Bonaventura, who published me for a while, 
rest in peace, Alvin. I love you, buddy. Yeah, you know, it's going to SBX, all these festivals I'd always heard of from Australia, which is so far away from everything. And we, we feel so distant in, in Australia from, you know, the American or the European comic scene. We're separated by such a large space of land and all that stuff sort of, you know, is quite legendary. So yeah, it all happened really, really quickly. Um, and like Alvin was selling my artwork to like, you know, heiresses from like large companies, like, you know, people that just collect art and stuff. And so I suddenly, I was a poor kid making money. Um, it, it was really whirlwind. I, I remember in an interview with Dan Adele, he was like, you, you're talking like you're a rock star or like, this is all some big thing, but it's just comics, you dickhead, like calm down. But I tried to explain to him what it was like to like suddenly after having nothing to suddenly have thousands of dollars and go to 10 countries in one year and just have lines of people fawning over your work while, while you look in the mirror and you hate yourself and trying to deal with people like, Oh, you're great. I'm like, Oh no. <laughs> like, and learning to take a compliment and learning to be diplomatic and not an idiot. But yeah, it really was. It was, it was mental that that period from like 2014, 2015, it was utterly mind blowing. And, and it felt very like as rock and roll as comics can feel. It really felt like that. It was, it was fucking crazy. Just, yeah, very blessed to go to like Russia and, you know, Iceland and Colombia and just all these places all over the world, all these different festivals and just meet so many interesting people. It was, it was bloody glorious. Yeah. No more of that. No, with the lockdown, but yeah, but we can zoom though and zoom. But yeah. No, nah, uh, fuck. And then, yeah, uh, moved to the U S uh, met my wife, uh, on a book tour in 2014. Um, full disclosure, she does work for my publisher. She's the director of marketing at Fanographics. Um, we'd been talking over Skype for like a year or something. We kind of both had crushes on each other and then finally met in real life. And it was just like electricity. I actually do write about this in the Eisner nominated uh, short comic from the We Told You So Fantagraphics history book. Uh, that book was snubbed for all awards except for the comic that I did within. So you're welcome, Fanographics. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, we met, we fell in love, had to do a year apart, visa shit, you know, trying to immigrate to the US is not easy. Yeah, got to the US and then like, shit, what am I gonna do? Um, you know, that, that brings us on to Seeds and Stems and the book we're promoting and the, and the zines that I've made in the past. You know, it's about half of the zines I've made in the, uh, since 2016. In January 2016, I landed in Seattle and yeah, I didn't want to get a real job. Uh, I'd been self sufficient um, from zines for a, f a few years, like a few book royalties. I, I really started going hard in Melbourne before I moved, uh, printing up like 300 copies of like certain zines and then sell them for 10 bucks online. Boom, $3,000. Like I was printing them real cheap, uh, this little zine shop, like one cent a side for black and white photocopies. I trim them all myself, assemble them, staple them. And so there's a good profit margin there. So it was just like, wow, I, I can like spin shit into gold, like a sad Rumpelstiltskin. I, yeah, I just started working really hard making zines and, and getting into a big cartel. Um, yeah, so, you know, I'd pack them all up, go down to the post office. And, uh, but yeah, it was a challenge in the US because I, I had to, I, I'd been relying on this zine shop called Sticky in the Melbourne underground subway system. And it was a really great community place where a lot of zine makers and comics people in Australia or Melbourne come up through. But really all the good cartoonists are in Melbourne, like Sydney, the dog shit, Perth, don't get me started. Like, Melbourne is comics town in Australia, 100%. So, yeah, I no longer had my, my cheap photocopies. Uh, Kinko's is horrible. I'm not going to go to Kinko's. So I don't even know if they exist anymore. Yeah, I found a really great little fucking family-run place called Saigon Printing near my house. Um, great little family-run thing. And pretty decent rates. Um, I decided to let them like staple and assemble. I was like, I have to stop spending so much time. I need to be producing content to print. I need to not be wasting time stapling, folding, assembling, trimming, you know, getting a, uh, 
you, you ever use the metal ruler with the with the blade? You put the metal ruler down on top of the zine and then you run the, the blade along and you slowly, slowly trim down the pages so they're not all pouring out the side. And inevitably you will slash your finger open. Uh, and that, that was happening a lot. So yeah, I started to let Tan down at Saigon Printing do my assembling, which was hard to, hard to do, but he does a great job. And, and I was producing zines in, uh, in larger numbers. So I was getting my print runs up to like, you know, five, six, you know, 100,000, you know, 1,200. And yeah, it's profitable. Um, and look, frankly, I was jacking my prices up. Like, let's be honest about it. I was trying to value myself as an artist. Like, I see a lot of zines out there. It's like two bucks, three bucks. But if I'm going to like waste my body, like, like almost kill myself for two weeks working nonstop every day, slamming out a zine until my fingers are raw and bloody and I'm literally wrapping a pan in a bandage so I can bear to hold it. I'm going to charge 10 bucks for that zine. I'm not going to give it away for three bucks. No, I want to make a bit of a profit on it. I actually, I had a fight with a guy at the fanzines festival in Paris about two years ago. I think it was, uh, it was this zine here, knife crime. This is uh, it's 36 pages. You got like a little little paper insert in there. Ooh, special bit of eff extra effort there. Yeah, letters, pages, all sorts of stuff. Big meaty story. I was really proud of it. I thought it was a really good zine. Ten bucks. And this guy was arguing with me like, "How dare you charge that much for a zine?" And like, "Fuck you!" And like, "What are you doing, Hanselman?" And I just started saying to him like, "I'm sorry. Like, I value myself as an artist. I'm not just gonna give this shit away." And like, you see artists selling prints, like a single image print. 30 to 50 dollars you know look how many images are, are in this this is like 12 panels a page this is like this is like 600 prints in one you, you get 600 images so it just doesn't make sense to me how you can charge that much for a single image print on a cheap piece of paper and but but somehow this is lesser somehow the emotion and the story that is in here is less i i just i i don't I have a real problem with artists selling their original art for like incredibly low prices. Like you have to start low when you're starting out, but you can't keep doing that. You have to value yourself and value your time. Like, like I read on the, like the new the symposium website, it's, you know, it's like, a, it's these about talking about a self-sustaining economic model. Like, Ooh, that sounds businessy, but it's the truth. Like, Comics is a business. It is a it is a product. It's art, but it, it's harnessed as a product. It's a, it's a, something that you're selling to people, and I make no bones about that. I I don't feel bad about that side of it. That the so you know the business side. It's it's very important because if you don't engage with that, like you, you're gonna be kind of fucked, really. <laughs> so yeah, kept on doing the zines, kept cranking them out. I was trying to do them like once every couple of months, uh, paying the rent, paying the bills jacking up the prices, trying to keep the quality up so people, okay, this is worth it, like, cool. And also all the time mailing it, like running a mailing system from the house, uh, stamps.com I think we use, you know, packing up a thousand packages, like when you've got seven rabbits downstairs, like crying out for like fresh hay and some affection, like it's a lot of juggling. So yeah, getting the zines out there. And then we come to the, the mass market, the collection of the zines. Um, I didn't really want to do this book, uh, Seeds and Stems, the, the, the collection of the zines. The zines were often billed as being very limited edition. That's, you know, part of the reason they were special. You know, they were hard to get. You had to like order them online through a big cartel shitty sales website. You got me and my wife packing them up. All the packages are full of rabbit hair. They were hard to get. So, you know, it's like, I always put it to like, uh, like records in the old days, like the specialness of digging through a crate of records and finding that rare record with the B-sides on it. You, you know, pre-internet, you can't get those B-sides anywhere else. That's special. Like you're connecting with this art, this, this rare physical art that, you, you know, it's, it's so romantic, so beautiful. So did I want to cheapen that by doing a, a budget repackaging for bandwagon jumpers? But on the other hand, you know, the zines are going, you know, fuck one of them here. I think I, I don't know which one it was. I got, I got a big stack of them here, but one of them was going for like 150 bucks on eBay. Like, 
there were vultures resellers. There were people I had to cut off from buying zines from my shop because I knew that they were buying bulk amounts to then flip and make a profit. And I was like, no, I make the profit. You don't make the profit. So yeah, what do I do? Do I, do I maintain that romantic crate digging rarity vibe where people can't see the work? They have to fight to find this work and it's, you know, basically never going to be seen. It's inaccessible, romantic, but inaccessible. So I, I broke down and decided to do the, the budget repackaging for, for Johnny come lately's. And I, I'm happy I did. Um, it turned out nice. It's, it's not got everything in there. I, I didn't print the covers from the zines, you know, so you don't get the covers or the letters pages. That's, you know, still exclusive to the zines. So the, the masturbatory fetishistic collectors can still get their jollies out of those. But, you know, you can get this from the library or anything. And, and you know, I had fun designing it. It's in a, it's in like a plastic, uh, a lot of my characters are dealing with drug addiction and stuff. So, you know, oh, it's in like a pill bottle. They're like, you know, she's like trapped inside the pill bottle, trapped inside drug world. And it also doubles as a convenient urine shield. So like, this really is the ultimate Paris Review toilet book. Uh, it's a classy toilet book that you can read on the toilet. And urine is not getting onto this thing. Because I, I am aware that uh, a lot of people come to my signings in the past, pre-COVID, and the books would be flecked with urine. Um, and I'm handling all these urine covered books that have clearly been in people's share house toilets. And it was quite disgusting. I have to use a lot of uh, hand sanitizer. It's before san hand, san hand sanitizer was popular. I was just like dousing myself in that shit after touching all those toilet books. So yeah, set out to make the ultimate toilet book. Um, didn't do too much press on this one. I, I actually pitched this to Fanographics to go on their Fanographics underground label, which is for sort of more avant-garde kind of less mainstream works. And I was like, it's, it's the rough scenes. There's a lot of rough work in here, experimental shit. Let's just do that. But then like, no, main line, do it on the main line. But we decided not to do too much press. Um, but I think the first print run is already almost sold out. Uh, it's like 8,000 something copies or in like a couple of weeks. Uh, which switching to web comics, I think that's exclusively because of Instagram, because I'm currently serializing a, a, a web comic. So, so the first time I've done this, uh, when COVID hit, I decided to do essentially a, a USO show. I, I decided, you know, everyone's trapped in their houses. Let's entertain the troops. Let's get out there, do a bit of a song and dance for the kids. Free entertainment every day. And I started doing a daily web comic and I, I saw my followers count go up from like, you know, 20, 30,000 to almost a hundred thousand. Um, people love free shit. People don't like having to go out of the house and, uh, and track down books. They, they like having free shit beamed into their phones. So perfect marketing in, in a way. Um, I've been really enjoying the, you know, the immediacy of the web comic. Um, and just banging that shit out there. And yeah, it really helped to sell this book, I think. Uh, you know, it's a decent entry point for new readers. There is a very complicated chronology with Megan Mogg. All the books are kind of out of order and it's a fucking nightmare. I get endless messages like, which book do I start with? You've made it so confusing, you idiot. And I was like, oh no. So yeah, this is a really easy entry point. This is just a bunch of spoofs and goofs. It's just, uh, there's a bit of pathos in there as well. Some raw sadness, but it's essentially experimental spooks and goofs. Um, so yeah, that went gangbusters. And of course I've had a few people complaining about the zines like, Oh, I spent $150 on that werewolf Jones zine on eBay and fuck you, Hanselman. It's like, well, what am I supposed to do? I, yeah. Yeah. No, bringing them. Uh, yeah. That, that, that is, look, to be honest, I've, I've finished my list of point form talking points. I, I had a, I had some, some point form talking points. I just talked for 40 minutes nonstop. I, I, I did the French price fight. I did no computers. I did Tasmania in the eighties. I did web versus print a little bit. I talked about a self-sustaining economic model. I think I've hit all the points and now the future is open. Who knows what's going to happen? The print industry seems to be surviving. Just one more ramble, one more epilogue um 
you know, at the start of all this COVID, it's like, are people still going to be buying comics? You know, I've switched to a web comics model of free content, trying to sort of advertise a book, uh, which has worked. But I, th I think alternative comics, art comics, are weirdly suited to surviving this epidemic, or this pandemic, sorry, pandemic. Because I, I don't know, people need entertainment. Hollywood's kind of shut down. Uh, people need entertainment. And I think tech people still have their jobs. And a lot of people that buy my work are tech nerds. So they've still got disposable income and they need ribald, uh, drug fueled, uh, rimming based cat and witch comic books. So, you know, uh, in conclusion, I win. I had the last laugh. Oh, thank you, yes. Thank you. So That's we're gonna try to open this up for questions, and I'd like to, uh, if you put your name in the chat, I'll or unmute you, or you can unmute yourself maybe, and we can actually hear in, uh, the, vo the question in your voice. I think it's more fun than me reading it. Oh, there'll be no questions, Ben. I just answered uh, any possible question over that. Possible. Sometimes people <laughs> just yeah. knock everybody out. Oh, here's a question. Oh, Jason. Little Jason. Little uh, go ahead. Hi. Hey Simon, how are you? Hello, Jason. How are you doing? Great. Uh, um, I don't know very many Australian cartoonists. Uh, I think the only ones I've met are the ones from Squishface Studios. Oh, yep, yep. Old Squishface, yep. Uh, ben Hutchings. Did you um, go to Australia to meet them? I, th I think they, no. did a par they did a tour years ago. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So that makes me think, are there other Australian cartoonists that you feel are underappreciated or just undiscovered by Americans that you can tell us about? Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, yeah, Squishface, interestingly, they, I know those guys. I uh, did like a thing at the National Gallery of Victoria with uh, some of those guys, Ben Hutchings um, and a few people. We did like a 30 day residency behind glass where we all made comics together and the public could come and watch. And they were talking about that caravan of comics where they were going to travel over and do SBX and Mocha or whatever they did. And I didn't do it because um, it was like 3K. Like you, you had to put in like 3K to do it. And I was like, well, I don't have the money. I, you know, I, I, I can't afford that. And, and my friend Jeffrey McKay, an Australian cartoonist who's very good. He does a mostly kids stuff these days, but he was doing more adult stuff. In the, and the you know, he does really good YA stuff these days, his little sort of squirrel character. But he said on that tour of Caravan Comics that really, he said, cold shoulder at TCAF, and they just felt like out of place. And, it, and he said it kind of sucked. And I was like, well, I'm fucking glad I didn't go. I'm glad I didn't spend 3K. I, I chose to wait and try and build an online, you know, sort of fan base, and then I could travel over to the, the States. But yeah, no, uh, yeah, Ben's great. Uh, yeah, Jeff, uh, Greg's great. Uh, the guy called Michael Vicaris, who runs the thing called Silent Army, he's been active for like 20 years. I, I call him the Papa Smurf of the Australian comic scene. Um, yeah, he does a lot of anthologies, a lot of, uh, he goes over like Jakarta and stuff, and like Indonesia and does a lot of workshops over there. And he's like really about community arts and like building the community. And I think he's quite successful at it. He has like this little storeroom art space where he sells people's work and he's really like a town crier out there trying to get the word out. And yeah, there's a bunch of people. I mean, Tommy Parrish uh, is from Melbourne. Uh, they had a fanographics book out about two years ago, like 2D Cloud Fanographics. Uh, Lee Lai is, is amazing. Uh, lives in uh, Montreal now, but from Melbourne. Uh, another contemporary from the Melbourne scene. Um, yeah, she's great. Um, I think... I don't know if it's, well, someone's publishing her book. I don't know if it's public yet, but uh, she's, she's nabbed a big uh, publishing deal with one of the, one of the major indies. <laughs> yeah, uh, Michael Hawkins, uh, he's, Michael Hawkins I was friends with since I was like, well, he's one of the guys in Hobart I was rambling about when I found the, the vegan cafe zine. Um, Michael Hawkins, he's in Melbourne now with Mark Pearson, another great cartoonist. I think D&Q have been sniffing around perhaps. I may have heard a rumour. Yeah, they run a thing called Glom Press. They have like the house full of risograph machines now. They're making a lot of fun stuff. Yeah, G L O M Glom Press. I think uh, Bailey Sharp and uh, their partner Ben. They've uh, they've joined in on that. Sam Wallman, an amazing political cartoonist, 
who I think pioneered the endless scroll or the, like the proper use of an end, endless scroll comic. He, he does a lot of stuff about unions and it, it's work that doesn't make it outside of America because it's about Australian unions and like workers unions. So it's, you know, it's not going to reach a, a large casual readership, but yeah, uh, locally on like news websites, he'd do these really incredibly inventive scrolling comics like I was talking about Dash Shaw's Body World earlier, and that was a really great example of the endless scroll. But the, the way Sam Wallman did it was absolutely impeccable. Yeah. There really is a wealth of stuff down there. We've got all the indie avant-garde shit. We've got, you know, there's a bunch of superhero publishers up in like Perth or something, I think. You know, the more mainstream end of things. We really, you know, we really do have a, you know, a wide selection of, of things, but... Like I was saying earlier, it's, it's hard to get out of Australia. It's hard to market our work elsewhere. You know, like poor Greg saying he got the cold shoulder at TCAF. He put all the money in. And... It, it's hard for me at TCAF. I, I, I went to Cake in Chicago like two years ago and lost money. Like I didn't make my flight money back. Like, you know, it was really great to hang out with all the Chicago cartoonists and the after parties are great. You know, half of it is socialising and, you know, talking shop with other artists. So... But yeah, it can be disheartening when you go to these places, you put so much heart into it and then you, it's not reciprocated. <laughs> but you have to not get depressed about it and just keep on trying. Like when I was nearly 30 and I was getting like really depressed, like I've wasted my life, like this is never gonna amount to anything. But, but that's a mistake because you have to make comics first and foremost for yourself. And, and secondly, your friends. You have to amuse yourself and try to get self gratification and self fulfillment from the work. And then you can worry about other people giving a fuck about it. Yeah. There's, a, there's a question. Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. Oi, oi, oi. There's a question from Maria. <laughs> Maria. I just, oops. Thanks for that you? intro, Simon. No worries. I love, I love babbling on. <laughs> yes, Maria? Hi. I was just oh. um, wondering if you have any advice for any starting off artists. I mean, I don't know if I want to become an artist, but I'm into like drawing comics and stuff like that, but it's really hard because it's so intimidating and I don't know what I'm doing most of the time. So if you just have some advice. I think it's like what I was just trying to get to with the, like, just do it for yourself. Like you, you have to just amuse yourself and, and find self-fulfillment. You have to not worry about what other people think. That, that'll come later you just yeah you just have to experiment like i was talking earlier about how i started a thousand page graphic novel when i was 21 and you know i thought i was ready but i i probably wasn't i think i think michael de forge and i used to talk about this back in the day about just doing short stories just experiment try different styles on don't commit to a large project it's going to stress you out and like ah just keep it short you know, keep a sketchbook, you know, if you can't think of a story idea, just sketch or just, and it'll just slowly come together. Like, I've had so many doubts throughout my you know, career, but really the, the main, the, the one thing I've done is just kept at it. I've not gotten disillusioned and just continued to just experiment and, and just try. And is that how style comes about? Because I also feel like I'm just copying people for now. Yeah. I, I said earlier, I used to get accused of being a Ben Jones yeah. or CF ripoff, the Fort Thunder stuff, hugely influential. I mean, a lot of Europeans, uh, do you know Kramer's Ergot, the anthology? Uh, Sammy Harkham, the editor of that, once facetiously advertised the anthology as check out what all the Europeans will be ripping off next year. And it's true. Like I walked into a gallery in Iceland once and I was like, wow, Ben Jones has a show here. Oh, no, no, no. It's just someone who likes their work. Uh, but that's fine. Like I felt so bad about it for many years. Like the call outs, like, Oh, you're just a Ben Jones rip off. I'm like, <sighs> but slowly you try and beat it out. You try and just get more influences in, go to as many galleries as you can or watch as many films, not just comics or art, just all sorts of mediums, stare at birds out the window and just try to push as many influences in. And it will, it'll all come together in the end. You know, my works, you know, it's just the Simpsons with a bit of paper rad and I, I want it to look like Hergé, like this really clean line, Ligne Claire style, but it doesn't. And, and that's okay. It is what it is. I tend to focus on the storytelling. Like as long as the beats are there 
and the idea is getting across and it's, it's, it's clear for the reader, then it's fine. Yeah, you, you just find your way naturally. Just keep at it and try not to get, you know, disillusioned, which, you know, easy to say. But, you know, yeah, just keep doing it. It makes some friends. You need some contemporaries. Like, it's so valuable to have other cartoonists or artists who are like-minded and you can trade work with and sort of push each other on. Like, wow, they got like this great page done and they're happy with it. I want to get a page done like that. Mm-hmm. And then they see your page and like, oh, I'm full of self you know like hatred and like your page is amazing and you, you both sort of spur each other on and you know not in a horribly sports competitive way but just a, a nice community way just you know thank you so much good Here's luck a question from jason katzen whoops katzenstein on youtube oh thanks hi hello hello hi simon i i love your work so much oh, um, shucks thank you it's all right i like it a bit <laughs> I have a two-part Mad Magazine question for you, if that's all right. Yes. Number one, were you reading in the 80s in Tasmania the Australian version of that, or were you getting the American one? And then number two, um, in addition to Spy vs. Spy, I was wondering when you were making your your Mad rip-off comics, if there were cartoonists from Mad that inspired you, if you could speak about them. Well, part one, yes, Australian Mad was everywhere. Like, we were all reading it at school. Uh, I had a friend whose father worked at the local city dump, and he would regularly find large boxes of Mad magazines at the dump and then hand them out to us. So people were just throwing out Mad magazines like crazy, like they were toilet paper. Um, But also, I was getting direct market American Mads, um, we had a few good comic shops open up in the late eighties, early nineties. I I was the kind of kid who would trawl all of the secondhand bookstores looking for old punch annuals, uh, New Zealand newspaper cartoons, European shit, anything I could get my hands on. And they started to get the American mad magazines. So me and my nerdy friends were comparing the Australian and the American editions. And I, I, all these comic shops were fronts for drugs. So they all closed down. They were all selling heroin out of the back doors. Um, but good comic shops, Electric Adventures, uh, Empire Comics, uh, great drug dealers, uh, great proprietors of uh, printed matter. You could get anything you wanted there. Um, and yeah, I, I love Sergio Aragones. Um, I love Don Martin. I mean, you know, yeah, Al Jaffe, you know. Yeah, probably Don Martin predominantly. Uh, you know, I, I loved my, my Spy vs. Spy, and then I love my Don Martin. He's a master. Yeah, love it. I got I got to go to the Mad Magazine offices uh, in 2014, which blew my mind. It was I wasn't allowed to. Uh, they said no photos, but I did sneak a bunch of photos. But yeah, I've got a bunch of weird photos I took there. I, I, I legally uh, signed an NDA. I can't talk about what I saw there. Yeah. There's a another a question from Julie uh, about printing. I think printing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hello. Okay. Hi. Hello. Oh, hi, Simon. Hello, there you are. Hi there. Hello. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for telling your story. It's just, ah. it's wonderful and congratulations. I, I just have a really, you know, just kind of odd situation. I'm just sort of throwing a question out there. I work at a prison, a maximum security prison, and we don't have any, uh, technology. So I'm trying to, I want to put together a zine that we can do because there's Mm. sure lots of great artists in there. And, um, you know, I'm in there as a drawing and painting instructor and I'm, you know, um, I'm looking for like cheap printing and, um, you know, ways to do it with almost no money and believe it or not, Kinko still exists. Yes. (laughs) Hate it. (laughs) Yeah. I think you, you want to be looking for, that, that's a great thing. I, I used to do work with uh, youth at like youth drop-in centers and like do drawing classes with kids. And it's very rewarding. And it's, it's great. Good work. Um, it's a nice therapeutic outlet for people. Um, yet yeah, local family run, you, you know, it takes a bit of legwork. Uh, but you want to look around locally for like a small family run place that prints like, uh, you know, uh, menus like you know or junk mail like paper menus for local restaurants or something and they'll be able to print up some simple chat booklets you know mm-hmm. black and white's fine you just want like a simple stapled black and white chat booklet 
and you could probably run that if you find the right place locally you know a dollar a unit 70 cents a unit maybe maybe less it depends it's trial and error it's, it's looking around and just there's like a place gorilla print a bit further on from my place saigon they're probably great um yeah, avoid the corporate stuff. I, I've had my dalliances with the Kinkos and the Office Works and Office Max. Uh, it's it's not a nice environment to be printing in. It's not very relaxed, and, and you have to figure out the machines, which mm -hmm. it's a lot of work figuring out how the bloody Xerox machine works and flipping things. And I, I maybe you're doing it on computers. Like I always did it by like with the originals and like this really archaic Luddite way. Mm -hmm. But if you get the files together, send them off to a local print shop get a little, you know, quote from them and see how it is. You shouldn't be paying more than like a dollar per unit for like a 30 page black and white chat booklet. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, good, good luck. Good Thank my, my, one of my books actually just got banned from a prison. The other day, a fan oh. sent me this letter. Uh, they, they sent their friend who was incarcerated a copy of my book one more year and it came back and said, it just promotes drug use and, uh, and it won't be allowed in the prison. And I call exactly. bullshit. I think my books do not glamorize drug use. It's about generations of failure and sort of the, this, this family. Anyway. The yeah. question from Desmond Reed. Hey, Simon. Hello, there you are with your space heater. Uh, yeah, that's me. Um, Heating I, uh, I, I, uh, this. Really enjoyed the uh, the Instagram comics very much. I genuinely look forward to it every day. Um, do you know what you're going to do after that? Once that story concludes, what the next uh, project is? Well, what I was supposed to be doing this year is Meg's Coven, which is the follow up to Bad Gateway, and it's sort of like a five part series. It's exploring Meg's history with her mother and grandmother, and yeah, these generations of like drug addiction with these women, and Meg trying to break out of that and try to change, and Meg and Mog's becoming more mature. Um, but yeah, no, COVID hit and then, yeah, I, that all went out the window and I just started doing the USO show, Free Entertainment, Goofball, uh, Werewolf Dildo Joke comic um, on Instagram. So yeah, after it's wrapped up, I mean, I am going to print that stuff as a book. The, the, the web comic was supposed to be a zine initially. I thought I'll go for about a month. COVID will probably blow over. I'll do it as a zine and then start on my next big, you know, major book. Um, but yeah, we're still in the throes of COVID and probably will be for a while, regrettably. So yeah, you know, I got, a, I got to the election or something and then I got to cut off the webcomic and get it ready for print. And then I think I'll start doing Meg's Coven. And I'll, the plan was to do that as zines. But Bad Gateway, I hid away for a year. No one saw me and I just worked on that book for a solid year. And it was very lonely and very painful and very stressful. So... Going forward, I think I want to serialize all my books through zines or maybe I'll start a Patreon and start doing it that way. I, I don't know. My, my print guy had to shut down from the pandemic, but he's open again. But then all the mailing, I, yeah, I, I don't know. It's all kind of up in the air, but I, I yeah. got to figure it out. Oh, I'm, having a, I'm having a stress meltdown now. Oh, oh. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be Meg's coven It'll, in some form or another, but yeah. Here's yeah. a question from Michelle. Hey, what's up? Hello. Hi. Uh, I have a question about time. Um, I was kind of wondering, like, do you keep track of, like, how much hour... Uh, you keep track of how many hours you put into each page, right? And I'm just wondering, like, when you started doing that and if you found that that really helps with comics, because I've been drawing comics for, like, four years on and off and uh recently i started keeping track of time and it like feels really good hmm. um, yeah it was kind of an experiment with bad gateway in 2018 i, I said i was going to start the book on the 1st of january and finish by december 31st and i i was like okay i'll count all the hours and keep track it was 3764 hours to write pencil ink color and finalize the book for print, uh, which I, I don't do any production myself. I'm a you know, complete Luddite, everything on paper. I use food coloring and watercolor. I, so, you know, m m yeah, Paul, the night man at Fanographics, he does all of my production for me, but I'm talking covers and end papers. I, I, yeah, I don't know if it was helpful. Like it, it's cool to be able to say like, it was this many hours and stuff and it, but it didn't really make a difference. Cause I was just, 
I had to work all day every day. Like I, I tried to keep to like a nine to five schedule for the first seven months of the year. And then it became readily, readily apparent that I was behind schedule and that I would have to kick it up. So sort of the last five months of 2018 was literally 18 hour work days, much to the chagrin of my wife, uh, who would have liked to have gone out to dinner or, you know, just had a nice time. But it's like, no, I have to color these witches. And it was grueling. It really did almost break me. Like, I, I feel like I almost had a nervous breakdown at the end of 2018, just with the stress of trying to finish that book. Uh, it's a fucking nightmare. But yeah, I mean, currently what I do is I, I try to just set a goal. Like, I have the luxury of being able to work on my webcomic in the day like, and piss my time away doing that. So I, I do that, for, you know, like, 10 to 5 if i go later i go later if i finished earlier good i just have that goal of one page a day i'm going to write pencil blah blah blah. you know it's all quick colored pencils and yeah once i get that done i can relax a bit in the evening and actually let myself hang out with my pets and my wife and eat food in a relaxed capacity which is a rarity for me just trying to be more of a well-balanced human being i think see I, i think just set small goals just like, I'm going to try and get this done today. And if you fail, that's fine. But it's yeah. just attempting to work to a little goal. But I, I don't think you need to keep track of it explicitly. But it is cool to be able to shout out a number at people. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, wow, yeah. that sounds psychotic. Like, that's, wow, that's too much time crammed into a small space. Right. So I think right. some people did break down that math and like, oh, that's a lot of work. Like, yes, it was. Yeah. 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 Good luck. Thank you. Here's I appreciate the yeah. Here's a question from Bill Cardalopoulos. Oh, Billy Cards. Hello. Oh, my unmuted. Let me turn my video on. Um, hello. Nice to see you, Simon. How you doing? I just, I actually did, you were sort of starting to touch on it uh, just now, but I wanted to ask you a little bit more about Crisis Zone because I've mm. definitely been addicted to that. Um, and I'm curious, um, just a little bit about the, like the narrative and how you have been working it up and how far in advance you're thinking. Because one of the things that's been impressive about it is, is that it seems like it can sort of digest like pretty recent events or even like, uh, recent comments on, on Instagram. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm also kind of wondering about um, if you feel like, you know, like you talked about it as, you know, kind of dumb dildo jokes and it is that, but also, I mean, it is what's what's sort of riveting about it is that those do interweave with like serious current events. Like, yeah, I mean, it was started out as like, oh, we're all under quarantine and this is scary, and then all of the George Floyd, uh, Black Lives Matter stuff. Then you, that's in a way you were kind of lucky to be in Seattle with the Chaz or the Chop. Yes, yeah, lucky. Yes. Well, I mean, just in, you know, you're going to be making that kind of comic. That was sort of like a perfect like landscape to put those characters in but yeah. sometimes there's a lot of like real pain and uh you know expression happening right now so how do you feel about that and like kind of the taking on the risk of like putting those characters in the middle of these like unpredictable and sort of painful events i'm playing it fast and loose so but well, first off i just want to Seeing your face, I remember the time I was at Angle M and me and Breck Evans, who's a very handsome, sweet-talking Lothario, we were trying to get into a club and they wouldn't let me. I was all dolled up, looked pretty good, I thought. Breck was there looking fan-fucking-tastic, big greasy Lothario, wouldn't let us in and you just walked right past and got into the club. Oh, interesting, I don't remember Straight that. past, yeah, straight yeah. past us. I and mean, we were both like, what the fuck? Yeah. I don't know, yeah, hats off to you. Oh, thanks. You are wearing a hat. I'm leaving it on because I still have terrible COVID hair, but continue. <laughs> yeah, me too. You know, under the wig, it's just a nightmare. Right. Oh, wait, no, this is my real hair. Yeah, look, I've got lots of notes with the, the COVID comic. I just, I just write down stuff on bits of paper, just little ideas. It's like, Drac Jr. Jr. Doll, keep talking through funeral. Like, I can't give this one away because this is something I'm working towards and that's, that I'm not giving that away. Yeah, there's, there's a rough structure. Like... Like the, the, the funeral that's happening in it right now, where Wolf Jones is holding a big funeral for all the characters that have passed away. It's been about three months, I've probably been leading up to that. And all sorts of other things have happened. Like, I intend to do something with a character and then it will just completely change. I, I will see a comment that will, you know, oh, okay. And like, you know, oh, I'll riff off of that. 
I mean, yesterday I pissed a lot of people off, like a lot of fucking people. Like the, the comments were like, oh, I woke up, oh no. Um, you know, I'd already drafted today's one. People were like, oh, you kind of responded to the comments. It's like, well, no, not really. I just actually did kind of a bit of a bait and switch. And, you know, I, some days I, I, you know, I am kind of vicariously risking cancellation with it. Like I, I'm trying to write honestly. I'm, I'm not censoring myself. I'm not scared of the purity teens. I'm just doing whatever the fuck I want and allowing myself to make mistakes as an artist. And I think that's really important to just not, you know, kind of give a fuck to try and be sensitive and not be willfully offensive, but allow yourself to explore. And yeah. And yeah, it's not all dildo jokes. There's a lot of relationship heavy shit in it and stuff, gender stuff, you know, it's like warring factions of my own brain, having a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's been a weird experiment. Um, it's, it's scary how many people are reading it now. I've, last week I separately had QAnon type right wing zealots calling me a pedophile and extreme left wing purity teens calling me a pedophile as well. Both extremes of the political spectrum. Like, it was, you know, that's like the, the only comments I delete are the hardcore right wing comments that are spewing hatred and stuff. Uh, you know, I'll let other people insult me as much as they fucking want and take me to task over a perceived slight or mistake. You know, you can learn from that stuff, but that there's no learning from the extreme uh, bigotry side of it. But yeah, it's, it's somewhat terrifying. Um, I kind of don't want Megan Mogg to get more popular because I think you just invite crazy people in to read into your work and start spewing conspiracy theories at you. Yeah. It's, it's been really weird. <laughs> Yes, yeah, it seemed to sell a lot of books. I mean, like I said earlier, we sold out of this. Like, you know, it's getting there. Like, you know, it's, it's going well with no press. Like, we decided no press, but I, I, I'm a drug pusher. I, I give out all this free content. There's a little taste every day. Here you go. There's a little bit of crisis zone. There's a little bit of a comic. And, like, if you want more, you go, you go pick up the book. So it's a good marketing tactic, I suppose. Yeah. It, it appears as if I'm a nice guy just trying to help society and some free entertainment, but really it's a, it's a slimy marketing technique and I'm laughing all the way to the back. Okay. Here's a well, question hope so. hope from, so. uh, Thanks Amy, Bill. Good Amy. to see you. Sorry. Stay cool. Amy. Billy Cards. Can't believe you got in that fucking Hi. club, man. Breck Evans. Hey. He's as fuck. So now I've been around on the oh, for a long time. I know. I know. <laughs> Everyone knows, oh, it's Bill K. All the clubs know him. Did you uh, have a question, Emmy? Oh, okay, thank you. Am I, okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned that the mad magazines that came from the United States were different from the ones in Australia. Yes. So um, I'm wondering if the texts were different or the characters or, or just a few words. And now that you're in the USA, are I don't know if you follow where your audiences or your biggest readers are. You becoming more American or something, or or mm. less Australian or more something else? Thank well, the, the the Mad magazines, the Australian ones, they kind of like shoehorn in a few extra sort of Australian specific parodies, like a a, a long running soap in Australia, Home and Away they do a get a local artist to do a parody of that. So, so it appealed to local people as well, but you'd still have all the other stuff in there and yeah, just, they just tried to localize it a bit, but th there weren't too many differences. Um, were there references in the American one that were puzzling to you or, or no, because in Australia, we get all the American stuff. Um, I, I feel like I'm lucky as a writer in that I got, all the European, all the British stuff and all the American stuff. So I feel like when I was growing up in America, you didn't really get BBC stuff. No one in the U S was watching the goodies or like, you know, British surrealism. You had to really work for it. But we, I feel like when I was a child, we had access to, to everything, the best of American, best of European, best of the world. So I, I got like a broad tasting of everything. And, and regarding readership, I mean, uh, I think it's 13 languages now. So like my, my stuff, Megan Mogg is big in Spain and France, uh, quite big in Russia. Um, I think it's the squalidness of my characters, like the suburban kind of drug addicts who are depressed and sort of fucking up their own lives. And I think a lot of people around the world can relate to that. I think it's, you know, it's universal. I, I, I certainly didn't set out to make an Australian comic. 
you know, I didn't want Megan Mogg to be like, let's go and kick the footy and have some fucking Vegemite. Look out for the kangaroos. Because no one, everyone's going to be like, ugh, what's that? So I, I'm trying not to make it too American because I do live in America now. And the webcomic I'm doing is firmly planted in the US because it's, you know, it's, you know, my experience of living in the US and processing that. Um, but I try to keep it as universal as possible, which I think is a smart idea from a business standpoint to not make your work too firmly planted in something. Like I was talking about my friend Sam Warman earlier, who makes this amazing work about Australian workers unions. And it's incredible, but he's never going to find a, a wide audience for that in France or Spain because it's so site specific. So he shot himself in the foot there. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, there's your answer. That's my story for you. <laughs> Here's a question from Aaron, if you're still there. Uh, hello there. Um, I have a question for you, Simon. Uh, when you make comics, is it a type of art therapy for yourself? And if so, um, is there a line between how much you give away and how much you keep? Well, 100% art therapy. I mean, I don't know what I'd do with myself otherwise. Like I was saying earlier, a lot of my friends from Tasmania are in prison for crimes and stuff, like, you know, the violent offenders. And, you know, it was rough to survive down there. Huge crime rate. You know, my father was a hell, Satan's rider or Hell's Angels. He was a biker. Like, I grew up around a very violent culture. Um, yeah, and I've always escaped into pop culture, fantasy. And my work is 100% like, you know, therapy and it, uh, sort of, what's the word? Um, you know, what's that thing when you quiet in your mind? The monks do it. Meditate. Jesus, terrible. It took me that long to get meditate. Yeah, it's meditative. Um, it's it's everything. Like I, I don't want to do this web comic most days. I wake up exhausted and tired, and like I, I don't want to. It's such a it's such pressure. I have people messaging me like, "This is my reason for waking up." Like, oh, don't not do the comic today. Like, we need you and it's like, fuck. So I, I feel like I have to do it. But then also if I sit around and just read a book, I, I, I feel I can't relax. I have to be working. It, it really grounds me and focuses me to just be alone with the page. I sit on the floor here on a $10 Ikea table with a little lamp. And, you know, I've got my pencils and my pens and I, I set a goal and I just work towards it. And the, the most magical moments is, uh, is when you realize like the record has been skipping on the player for like three hours and you've not noticed. I often watch TV or listen to music when I work, but the, the times when you just get so absorbed in the work, everything else deteriorates. So, you know, I have a lot of anxiety and stress, fancy shit going on, but really to just get completely lost in a single task. And that's what I've worked towards my entire life, just boiling it down to, you have to sit at a table and draw witches in little boxes. And that, that level of purity is, is absolutely beautiful, that singular focus. Mm -hmm. And in terms of what was the second part of the question about giving away or? Well, there's a point where, I don't know, you realize something in your comics and you might, do you keep it or do you pass on to the readers? Yeah, I, I, don't even, I don't even know what I think about it. I just kind of do it. I, I read reviews of my books on Goodreads sometimes, and I'm like, oh, that's what that means. I think sometimes like a therapist needs to point something out to you. Yeah, you have to have someone else point out what that means. I don't know if I'm smart enough to decipher what I'm actually doing. Um, yeah, I, and that's another thing. Like, I try not to think about it too much. I, I think if you get bogged down thinking about every aspect of something and second-guessing yourself, like most of my scripts are like first go, like I'll just write it and like, ah, good enough. Like I can't make that any better. I probably could, but you know, I'll do edits and stuff. I'll ask my wife, is this funny? And you know, but yeah, I, I think it's, you, you want it to be almost automatic. It's like, I, I used to try and draw for as long as I could without sleeping. My record is 40 hours. I watched four seasons of Game of Thrones back to back and just worked and just kept drawing. And it became so automatic. Like I was fearful to go to sleep because once you wake up, it's like being a newborn baby and you're just, ah, and you have to, you're shaky and you have to like come back to life. But if, if you just keep working for these long periods of time, which is so unhealthy on the, you know, physically, but 
it just it just it just becomes second nature just the, the brain through the arm to the pen oh, it just just, just automatic just coming straight out but I, I don't recommend drawing for uh, 40 hours uh, non-stop I, I actually went to an arts launch of a friend's at a gallery after that and I was I was seeing things and kind of like weird visions yeah <laughs> it was not healthy sleep deprivation is a hell of a drug yeah and that's my story for you thank okay. you here's i think and mm -hmm. one more question from julia nice uh, julia yeah hi um i'm trying Hello. to hi um yeah thank you so much for your presentation i'm curious uh to hear more about the origins of your characters if you have, um, uh, I guess read it, reading it, it's, they're almost like archetypal characters. Like I could see so many people that I've met, you know, and have known in them. And I wondered whether, at, you know, when you were first developing them, whether, whether they came from people that you, you knew or, or more, were more archetyped or they were more um, based on, you know, um, yeah. situations that you've heard or seen. Bit of, bit of both. Like I was saying, I grew up around a lot of crazy junkies and bikers. So, and Tasmania is a weird fucking place full of a lot of odd people. So, yeah, I grew up around a lot of dysfunction. So there's a lot of autobiography in it. Not, not things that I've done per se, but things I've witnessed, just archetypes I've witnessed. And, and yeah, I was going for a sitcom kind of thing. I wanted, to be, I wanted it to be like Seinfeldian in a way. You've got your straight man. You've got your wild card. You've got, you know, yeah, it breaks down into... It's different parts of my personality as well. I can compartmentalize the id and the, the good part and the bad part. And, you know, they do battle. I, you know, I just put them on the page. It's like paper theater. I just, yeah, they just, the different personalities, they just dance on the page. And I mean, truthfully, I didn't really think about it that much when I made up Megan Mogg. I just wanted it to be a fun kind of sitcom thing, kind of, it's evolved, it's changed, it's, it's like sharpening a knife, I suppose. It was a very dull knife in the beginning, but I've slowly sharpened it and uh, made it slash much more effectively. And I, I really do feel like I know the characters. In a way, they are all me. Um, well, they're just people I've known, the, the horrible dynamics I've grown up around. And I am very thankful for my incredibly dysfunctional, fucked up upbringing, because I think it's given me something to write about and something to, you know, process i used to be very jealous of my well-to-do friends with their normal parents and their computers and their food but uh looking back i'm glad for the gritty upbringing i had uh, yeah again i just i i don't know <laughs> don't think about things too much you just sort of i don't know if it's if it's right it's right <laughs> yeah happy accidents okay. yeah yeah I think that's the last question I see, unless anybody has anything else to ask or say. Yeah, I should um, piss off and attend my rabbits. Great. What? I just uh, saying I should I should piss off and attend to my rabbits probably. Right, right. Okay, that was great. That's Incredibly well, interesting. Um, next week, thank you, uh, Simon. Yeah, thanks for having great. me, Ben. It was a real pleasure thank to come you. back and do it. I yeah, can applaud. I'm applauding for everybody. Um, next week is uh, Jenny Goldstick, who I think is here. She's um, an information designer and a cartoonist and an illustrator, and she'll be talking about her work. Same time, it's no nice. place, just online. And if you go to the uh, New York Comics Symposium, you can sign up for the uh, mailing list to know what's happening. And there's a schedule for the rest of the year. You've so got some good ones coming up. I was browsing the upcoming slate and yeah, yeah. get into comics fans because some of them are going to be fucking bangers. Yeah, there's some amazing people. And now they're all from all over the world and they're worked, you know, they're up in the middle of the night talking to us. So it should be fun. But that was great, Simon. Very oh, highly you, entertaining. Oh, I hope so. I, I live to give. <laughs> that was great. Thanks, Simon and Ben. Nice one. Thank Cheers. You. Thank All you. Right. So I'll I'm sweating you. bullets. I'm going to go give out some wheat treats to these beautiful, beautiful rescue rabbits. Thank you, Simon. Again, thanks for having me, Ben. Yeah. Mwah. Good night. Everyone stay safe out there. Good night. See you in the funny pages.